Welcome back to the medical report. Um, our guest speaker is Dr. Todd Mishner, who is an orthopedic surgeon with the Chester County Orthopedic uh, Associates. Uh, Dr. Mishner specializes in, in shoulder and sports uh, orthopedics. And so far, we've been talking a little bit about a few things like epicondylitis and frozen shoulders. And we were in the process of discussing the rotator cuff uh, issues. Um, he discussed a little bit about the, what the rotator cuff is and, and how he diagnoses what is a rotator cuff injury. Can you tell, tell us a little bit more about the tears that occur and, and the degree of tears and what makes the difference in how you manage them? Sure. Um, there are a variety of tears. Like I said, there's a partial thickness tear where it doesn't go through the whole width of the tendon, and then there's a full thickness tear, meaning it goes through the whole tendon, and then that can become small, medium, large, and massive tears. Um, or is it sort of, again, as tends to be a spectrum of an injury. Most tears are not traumatic. So I hear a lot of people say, oh, I didn't do anything specific. I didn't slip. I didn't fall. I wasn't a pitcher. I say 85 to 90 percent of the tears that I see are not, or what I call atraumatic. So they're just life-related uh, issues. And, um, and again, typically, how my differentiating criteria is pain, sig again, significant pain at night and significant weakness on exam is when I'm really concerned about a tear. And that will change how I will treat you or imaging yeah. studies that I will order based on that. Yeah. Now, getting back to diagnostic studies, what, what is the uh, best diagnostic study to determine the tear? The best diagnostic study to get a tear, to determine a tear, is an MRI um, or an ultrasound. X-rays are good for looking for arthritis, um, but not great at for looking for a tear. But I'm very selective on who I order an MRI for because we don't just want to order an MRI on every person because um, I decide if it's going to change my course of treatment is when I'll order an MRI. Okay. So when, when is surgical intervention indicated? Typically, a surgery is indicated for somebody that has persistent shoulder pain or weakness and or weakness um, that's failed conservative treatment and failed injections, physical therapy. Um, the concern about having a full thickness tear is it gets bigger with time. And the natural history, I mean, if we don't do anything, that small tear will become a big tear over time. And so if you have symptoms of pain or weakness, and I know you have a full thickness tear, depending on where we are in life, I will consider fixing it to prevent, you know, to treat the symptom as well as to prevent progression of that issue. Uh, off the top of your head, is there a percentage that requires surgery, would you say? I think of the full thickness tears, um, you know, more than 50% will require okay. tears. Probably 75 to 80% of full okay. thickness tears will require surgery. And, and what about the outcomes? Is that a, a, most of the time, is it successful permanently? Yeah, the yeah. Uh, surgery, nowadays we do everything arthroscopically. Um, very few people will do it open anymore. The results are as good or better if we do it arthroscopically. So that means just making little poke holes around the shoulder and going in with a camera and repairing the tissue that way. So it's less traumatic. It's still a significant recovery, but the overall results are very good. Pain relief is almost universal. 98% of people get good, excellent pain relief. Function in terms of overall use is directly related to how well the rotator cuff heals. And so smaller tears heal better than bigger tears, so we rather fix them when they're small than when they're big because the, the functional results are better that way. Is there any particular movement or activity other than falling down the stairs or something like that, that that is commonly associated with this? I know you said some of them are not related to physical activity, but is there any repetitive thing that can precipitate it? Absolutely. I think repetitive overhead activities, uh, uh, painting, hanging pictures, uh, nailing. Um, so I, I say any sort of repetitive overhead lifting activities is not a good idea. And when you're going to the gym and working out, like they have you doing these uh, weight machines overhead. I tell anybody over 30, that's sort of my rule of thumb, is I don't like you to do that with weight because that sort of can lead to rotator cuff irritation, not necessarily tears, uh -oh. but problems. I've been doing that every day for years. I, know. I better stop doing it. <laughs> well, I just say, cause I, I say, that's when I start seeing people having that okay. uh, problems. And so to make that less likely of an issue, right. I would okay. avoid that. 
All right. Well, that's pretty. That's a pretty good summary of, of that. I think. I hope our viewers understand now the difference between what epicondylitis is, and what what the difference is between a frozen shoulder and a rotator cuff problem and a and a and a, a tear and, and just a pull. So, we're going to move on a little bit now to uh, non-arthroplasty. So. Can you tell our viewers what non-arthroplasty is? <laughs> well, uh, I'm a sports medicine doctor, so my goal is joint preservation. So preserving the joint in any way in which we can, and, uh, as opposed to non-arthroplasty means joint replacement. And so uh, my goal is to get people with arthritis, you know, to treat their symptoms without requiring a joint replacement surgery. That's sort of the end stage. The last resort is doing a joint replacement. So non-arthroplasty means non-joint replacement procedures or treatments. Now you're talking about all the joints that are most commonly replaced, like the knee. Yeah, the knee. The typically, hip, in regards to the, the shoulder, there's typically the shoulder and uh, the knee. The knee probably being the, is the most common joint replacement out there. Um, so when I say non-arthroplasty, I'm really referring to the knee typically. Okay. And and the hip, too, as well. Are we going to talk a little bit about that? Not too much about the okay. hip, more about right. the knee. All right, so, <laughs> so let's, uh, let's start with the question, uh, who is a candidate for non-arthroplasty? So uh, non, uh, these are people who do not have uh, diffuse uh, arthritis throughout their knee. So it's, uh, they're in the early stages of arthritis, or it's only isolated to one part of the knee and not throughout the knee. Um, are candidates for this kind of treatment. And this is a localized problem within the knee? Yeah, typically, uh, if that can be related to, it can be meniscus tears related to arthritis, um, it can be con joint contractures that happen as uh, arthritis advances. There are some techniques that we can do to sort of uh, increase the joint volume. All right. So tell us then what, what you will do for these folks. Well, uh, typically, um, first thing is um, strengthening and uh, exercise, and exercise, I always say motion is lotion. So exercise is important, but the type of exercise you do is important that you don't do activities that make the problem worse or exacerbate the issues. Um, but strengthening uh, is very important. So keeping the muscles strong, not only do they not only do your muscles move your joints, but they also absorb energy. So as you're walking and doing various activities, the stronger your muscles are, the more energy they absorb, the less that is transmitted to that joint. So that's probably the first thing, is strengthening. Flexibility is very important. So as we continue to mature in life, it's important that we spend adequate time warming up uh, and then working on stretching. So I think as we're all rushing around, uh, you know, playing golf or doing whatever activity, we don't give enough time to stretch, and that plays, plays an important role. Um, and so that uh, is the sort of the basic what I'll do, and physical therapy is incorporated in that. But if we have an exacerbation of pain, sometimes a cortisone shot can be helpful. Sometimes these lubrication medicines, which I'm sure you've heard about, for arthritis are extremely helpful to keep people uh, active, and we can do that every six months, and, and uh, that's been shown to be beneficial in terms of relieving symptoms. And also there's some theory, not quite shown yet, but theory that it, it slows down the progression of the disease. The injection of this viscous this, material? Yes, yeah, so yeah. this lubrication medicine. Mm -hmm. Okay. Orthovis, Synvis, Halgan are the common types that you'll hear. Now, what about walking? Um, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of folks like to walk. Yes. And uh, uh, somebody who has, say, uh, early degenerative disease, perhaps, that you could, you could help them with the medical management rather than with the surgical procedure. What, what's your advice to them about walking, shoes and so forth? Uh, I think uh, walking is very important. I think uh, it's important to use, um, have a, a shoe that has a lot of cushion. So it, again, that sort of helps with the shock absorbing area. So again, the uh, and surfaces make a difference. If you find walking on the road or the concrete's hard, uh, is difficult and it makes your pain worse, then I typically tell you we're we'll going on a softer surface or a track at a local high school where they have a more forgiving surface is important. I think hills, Tend to, flat surfaces are better than inclines because uh, you'll find people in hilly neighborhoods tend to have a lot of more problems with their kneecaps, pain in the front of their knee, 
Um, so uh, flat surfaces definitely make a, uh, are a better choice if you're walking and have knee problems. So it's kind of hard to go uphill both ways, isn't it? That's and true. Down, down, <laughs> downhill, downhill seems to be harder on the knees than uphill, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Just like going down the stairs tends to be worse than going okay. up. All right. So if, if, someone, if someone has, um, you know, um, an, a meniscus, Tear, for example. Correct. Are you going to be able to treat them by non-arthroplasty? Yes. Uh, meniscus tears, if you have a symptomatic meniscus tear, uh, that's probably the easiest thing treated without a joint replacement. Um, if you try the medical management, or we've tried some uh, injections, um, but if you have pain locally, localized specifically to where the meniscus is, and we talk about the meniscus, we're talking about the shock absorber um, in the knee, can you see that? Um, so these are these little C-shaped structures, that's a shock absorber to your knee. So if you have pain localized to that area in a uh, degenerative meniscus tear, we can go in there arthroscopically and remove that torn meniscus. Can't get rid of the arthritis, but we can get rid of that sharp stabbing pain related to the meniscus. Can't get rid of the arthritis, but we can get rid of the sharp stabbing pain related to the meniscus. And that's a great option. And at the same time, if I know somebody has some, um, has some arthritis in their knee, what I do is a, uh, there's a gentleman, Dr. Stedman, who sort of pioneered this uh, treatment for people with arthritis and other issues uh, in the knee um, where you basically inject fluid at the time of, of surgery and we try to distend the joint and then I'll also release some uh, contractures and scar tissue in the knee that has actually been shown to be uh, very helpful uh, in eliminating the symptoms from arthritis. Okay. Now, can we apply any of this non-arthroplasty to the shoulder? You can. Um, similarly, uh, the injections are very helpful. The lubrication medicine are also very helpful for people that have arthritis of the shoulder. Um, and it's in, the FDA hasn't approved it, but it's an off-label use. The studies show that it works in the shoulder, and I will often uh, do that for people with arthritis. Again, most people that have shoulder problems, 90 to 95% of them are rotator cuff or frozen shoulder, mm -hmm. and less likely arthritis. Less likely. Unlike the knee, uh, where most people it's some sort of arthritis-related issue. So what are the outcomes of, of this overall? What's the success rate of, of say, non-surgical intervention? put it that way of treatment. I think non-surgical intervention is, is good in the appropriate person. It, the, unfortunately, the natural history of arthritis is it's going to get worse with time. Yeah. And so our goal is to slow down the progression of that disease, treat the symptoms accordingly, um, and preserve that joint as long as we can before people ultimately need a knee replacement. So if we can get you later on into life with your normal knee, the more successful that knee replacement will be and less likely that it will need to be done again. Well, this has been a really terrific discussion. I wonder if there's anything that, that I haven't asked you that, that, that you thought you might talk about today. Sure. Um, I think he's addressed a lot of the issues that I want to talk about, but I can't emphasize the uh, importance of warming up and, stretch, and stretching. And, so may, and it's important to stay, work on your cardiovascular exercise, work on your strengthening. Strengthening has been shown to maintain muscle mass later on to life, and there's benefits up into your 80s and 90s to continue doing resistant exercises. And I can't emphasize enough the importance of flex uh, stretching. Um, and that's about it. So as a demonstration of, of, of my exercise pattern, can we do an arm wrestle here? This <laughs> That sounds I'm, good. I'm just kidding. I might beat you. That would, I know. That, that would, would be, be embarrassing, embarrassing on TV. That, uh... so, <laughs> uh, I really think this has been wonderful, and, and, and we thank you so much, Dr. Mishner, for, for joining us, and, and I'm sure our viewers have enjoyed it. So. Yeah.